Yeah, hello, my name is Melissa and uh, I'm based in Brazil, I'm Brazilian. Uh, my background is not in imaging at all. I am a mathematician by training, but I have been working with uh, open source projects and specifically uh, scientific open source projects for about three and a half years. And I'm happy to be a contributor to Napari as part of my job at Quantside Labs, which is a company that supports open source maintainers, specifically focusing on uh, PyData and scientific Python projects. Um, so yes, I am here today. I'm not gonna say too many words about myself, but I am super happy to be here. And we have a lot of material to cover and we have 30 minutes, maybe a little less. So um yeah i'm super happy to be here and to be clear i'm in brazil i speak portuguese so if you have questions in portuguese i would welcome those if you have questions in spanish i can also manage so <laughs> we'll we'll try and make that happen so i didn't prepare slides because i think it would be nicer if we could actually go through the notebooks that we have so these are the sequence to the notebooks that marcelo was just showing um, so I'm going to show you here, this is the same repository and the same folder that he was showing you before. And I'm just going to go over some of the extra notebooks that he didn't go through. So we are going to start at 05D masking.ipynb. So if you have those notebooks there and you want to follow with me and you want to execute the notebooks as I speak, that would be nice because then you can also ask questions and experiment a little bit. Now, like I said, we don't have a lot of time. So if you don't have the time to experiment right now, or maybe you're not able to execute the notebooks, that's fine. You can make sure to come back to those later, maybe tomorrow as people are mentioning and, and then experiment and do the exercises. I know this has been a long day. I was here for the opening earlier today and I know that there's a lot of content. So if you're not following everything that I say that is perfectly normal, don't expect to understand all of the single details right now. Um, you can always come back to this material later. All right, so uh, we are going to get started with NumPy arrays. So Marcelo was mentioning to you how NumPy arrays are, you can look at them as lists of lists or as matrices um, or n-dimensional arrays. And so what they are are collections of numbers uh, that are kind of rectangular, right? So we want to have um, a number of elements all squished into one variable. So I am going to talk a little bit about how to select and filter out those elements inside a NumPy array by using something that we call a mask. So here you can see a uh, first NumPy array and we make sure to import NumPy as this is a library that we have to use in our program to make sure that we have the data structure that we need. And we are defining a variable called measurements. And in this variable, we are assigning a value that is a NumPy array. Uh, so starting with a list with the values 1, 17, 25, 3, 5, 26, and 12, we make this into an array, a NumPy array, and then assign this to measurements. Uh, in Jupyter Lab, I know that you were discussing a little bit about Jupyter before, but just to make sure, uh, when you write a variable name like this without any assignment or any operation happening to it, this will display the value of the variable as you execute the cell. So I'm going to hit Shift uh, Enter, and this is going to execute the cell and display the result. So it's just confirming that measurements is a variable that now contains this NumPy array as a value. So what we wanna do here is create a mask. So this is like a filter that is going to flag all the measurements that satisfy certain conditions. In my case, I wanna make sure to flag all of the elements of this measurements array that have a value above 10. So anything in measurements that is greater than 10 is going to be assigned to this mask or is going to be flagged 
by this mask. So I am going to execute this cell and we're going to see the value of mask. This is going to show me an array. So you can see that the result is also a NumPy array, but now it doesn't have numbers in it anymore. It has values such as false and true. So this is what we call Boolean variables or Boolean values. Um, so what is it saying? If you look at the condition, which is measurements greater than 10, it's going to show me if this is true for each of the elements of the array. So one is not greater than 10, so the result is false. 17 is greater than 10, so the result is true, and so on. So you can see that it is it has applied the measurements greater than 10 condition to all of the elements of the array, and then shows me the result in true and false values. We can then apply this mask to my data. So the resulting uh, array, which is a Boolean array, so this true and false array, we are going to use this as an index to my original array. So my original array was called measurements, and I want to select the elements for which the mask is true. Now, if I execute this cell, what we're gonna have is the result is every value in the measurements array that is greater than 10. Take some time to understand what happened. And this is super useful because you can use this strategy to filter out an entire array at once. So you don't have to look at every element and then decide if it satisfies a condition or not. You can just apply the condition to every single entry in the array at the same time. Now, there is one problem or a caveat, a detail, that the shape of the masked array or the result is not the same as the original array, right? So the original array had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements, and the resulting array has four entries. So you can see that it only returns the entries for which the condition is true. To avoid that and to make a big array that has exactly the same size as the original array, we can create a copy. Now, this is a kind of complicated um, concept that we won't have a lot of time to go through today, but you can click this link over here and it should bring you to the documentation on copies and views for NumPy. So you can take a look at this documentation later and then um, understand how this works. But the basic idea is that you're creating a safe copy of this array that you're going to manipulate. So your original measurements are still there, but you're going to create a new array to tinker with the elements. Now, we're going to do this complicated operation here that does the following. So now I'm going to take this filtered measurements, which is the copy of my original array. And for every entry, that is false on the mask. So the tilde here represents the operation not. So not true is false, right? So whenever you have a true value in the mask, the result here is gonna be false. Whenever you have a false value in the mask, the result is gonna be true. So for every entry that was false in the mask, I am going to assign the value minus one. So let's see what this is going to do. Let's show the shape of these arrays. So both measurements and filtered measurements, one is a copy of the other. So they both have the same shape or they both have the same size, which is seven elements. But what did I have on measurements? I had the original entries for my array. And in filter measurements, I'm going to have the following. Whenever a value is above 10, it stays the same. Whenever a value is below or equal to 10, it's gonna be reassigned the value of minus one. So what I just did was filter all of my undesired values. So whatever was under 10 and kind of removed it from my array or flagged it with a different value that I can later identify. Now, minus one was convenient here because all of my entries in the original array were integer values and so and positive integer values. 
So minus one is obviously a flag, but if you have different kinds like floating point values and you could have a, a legitimate minus one, maybe you don't wanna use this. So you have other strategies, but I'm not gonna go into detail here. Um, so there's an exercise that I will leave for you and you can work on this on your own time, maybe tomorrow, uh, creating a new mask for all measurements below 20, applying the mask to retrieve a new array with these numbers below 20 and compute the average of all of these numbers. But before we leave this uh, notebook, I wanted to show you an actual example of how you would use this in practice in an image. Uh, so of course, masks, just like arrays, can also be n-dimensional. So I'm going to show you this data sets uh, module from the SciPy library that has a face function. This function returns an interesting array. So you can see this is like a big matrix. It has a bunch of numbers on it, right? So what is this? If I actually treat this as an, an image and I ask for the shape, you can see that this has 768 elements by 1024 by three. So it's like three matrices of 768 by 1024 elements. And what this is doing is actually building an image that has color. And so each of those three axes that we are mentioning in the end here are the red, green, and blue layers for the image. So the resulting image is this. This is a, a raccoon, I believe. And what we can do is we can use the masking strategy to filter out some of the elements in this picture, in this image. So for example, I'll create a mask that says, select all of the elements in this image that are above 200. So if I scroll up a little bit, you can see that the entries are between zero and 255 because they represent RGB values. So whatever is above 200, I will include in my mask. I'll execute this and then show you the shape. It has exactly the same shape as my original uh, array. And now, of course, if you do this, if you just apply the mask to the image without doing the copy trick that I showed you before, you get a disorganized array. It's no longer organized as an image, a 768 by 1024 image. So what you want to do, uh, and just to show you that this is true, you have a big array with a bunch of numbers in it, but it's not, no longer organized like an image. So the copy trick that I showed you before will help us here. So what I'll do is that I'll copy this image and then for every entry that is above 200, like we selected above, I'm going to reassign that value to zero. So what this is going to do is it's going to add black pixels to a lot of the entries in this image. So it's going to change um, how this image is rendered. There is another suggestion of an exercise here using the same example. So you can go through this on your own time. And then whenever you have these characters here, the underlying characters, you are going to delete that and replace with your own value. Maybe you want something like 150 or you want something like 20. You can experiment with these numbers and then try and see what happens to the image. I left you a few um, a, a link here that also explains how to do this masking strategy with the numpy.ma module, which is a, a more specialized master arrays module from numpy. Any questions before I go to the next notebook? One thing that you can do, I think we are going to go through a different strategy in another notebook, but one thing that you can do, for example, here, you apply the mask and then you have this array, you can come and say, what is the length of this array? And actually, because this is an, a NumPy array, you don't even need the length, you can get the shape. So it's gonna tell you four. So these are all of the elements or how many elements in my original array are greater than 10. Does that make sense? Cool, so I will 
have to go quickly through these notebooks, but this is a refresher. So you probably seen this before somehow. If you haven't, please click on every link that we show here and you should be able to reach some documentation, tutorials, some explanation of what we're doing. So this uh, notebook is going to very briefly talk about dictionaries. So you've seen a few data structures today, such as lists, NumPy arrays, tuples, and now we're going to mention dictionaries. So dictionaries, you can think of it as a table or a key value pair. So you're going to have a, a set or a um, collection of key value pairs. So you can define a dictionary like this uh, with a curly braces. This is how we call it in English. I don't know how you call it in Spanish. In Portuguese, this is, uh, we call it Chaves. But this is what we have. So this is curly braces. And then you have, in this case, a string, which is the name of this key that we're going to use to store the value. And this is the value. And between those two, you're going to use a colon. It is much easier to see what's happening if you write it like this. And to be clear, these two cells are doing exactly the same thing. The only difference is that the second one is more organized and easier to read. So what you're doing is in the first entry of this dictionary, you have a key that is called X resolution and the value 0 0.25. Then you have a comma to separate the, the, the entries. And then for the second entry, you have Y resolution with a value of 0 0.25. So this is a dictionary and it's going to store all of this information for you. If you ask Python to show you how this looks like internally, it's going to print it out like this. Now, if you want to access one entry in the dictionary, you can use its key. That's why the key is usually a string because then you can use that string uh, to ask for the value back. So you can say in this dictionary that I have, what is the value corresponding to the X resolution key? And it's going to respond uh, to you that this is 0 0.25. You can add elements to the dictionary by including an extra key that didn't already exist. So if you look at the previous keys was X resolution, Y resolution, Z resolution, and voxel physical unit. And you're adding an extra one that is called FPS, assigning it with a value of 60. So now when you do this, your dictionary has an extra field or an extra entry uh, with a FPS key and a value of 60. If you want to know what are all of the keys that you have in your dictionary, you can use this syntax. So you using the name of your dictionary, you append a dot and then keys with the parentheses. This is important. And then when you execute that, it's going to show you all of your keys without the values. If you ask for uh, uh, the results to this operation is a list and you can see this because it has the square brackets around it. Now that it's a list, you can treat it as a list just like any other list. So if you ask for keys entry one, remember that Python starts with zero. So keys entry one is the second entry in this list. So it's gonna be Y resolution. So like I said, you can understand dictionaries kind of like tables, and that's how you can represent the values here. So for example, you, if you have a set of measurements over your week, uh, you can have the measurements for Monday listed here and see the value for a given key doesn't have to be a number. It can be a list just like it is here. So for Monday, you have this list. For Tuesday, you have another list and so on. So if you execute this, the result is kind of like a table of values associated to the, the days of the week. Uh, if you want to know what were the measurements on Monday, you can ask for it using the key, and then you're going to get your list back. You can also store variables in these tables. So you assign a, some value to some variable. In this case, we're calling the variables w1, h1, and area1, and so on. 
And when you do rectangles as a dictionary, and then you include W1 and W2, H1 and H2, and all of these variables in your dictionary, it's going to know that you're referring to the previous variables you have already defined. So if you ask for what is inside rectangles, it's going to show you that table with the appropriate values. Now, uh, Marcelo was mentioning pandas before. Again, we're not going to focus on this today, but I'm just going to show you that you can also use pandas to represent tables. And it is actually pretty nice because then you have a more organized view of your table and it's actually pretty. It prints out in a pretty way in your Jupyter uh, interface. So it's worth looking into pandas if you have a lot of tabular data. Um, there's a, uh, an exercise, very simple exercise here that you can execute later. Uh, but this is the refresher on dictionaries. You're not going to be using dictionaries so much day to day for specific numerical values, but you might be using it a lot to organize your results. For example, if you want to put them in a table or as someone was mentioning before, Excel data, for example. So might as well know about dictionaries. Now, one of the questions before was, what happens if I want to select some of the data from my array or from my image, depending on its value, if it is bigger than 200, or if it is lower than uh, 50, or some logical condition, to select that and to execute code based on a logical condition, we use the if statement in Python. And to be clear, the actual statement is called if, else, uh, or elif, which is for an extra condition that I might um, add to my code. And I'm going to show you a few examples. So first of all, there's a few questions that we can always ask. And this is true for most programming languages. So for example, I can ask, is 3 bigger than 4? And as you've seen before in the mask uh, notebook, this is going to return a value that is either true or false. So three is bigger than four. No, this is not true. So it's going to return false. If I have variables and I assign values to these variables, I can also test the variables themselves. Because I've assigned three to A and I have assigned four to B, if I ask, is A larger than B, it's going to tell me false. 3 is not bigger than 4. Now, if I ask the opposite, is A smaller than B, then it's going to say true because 3, three is smaller than 4. Uh, there's other things that I can write. For example, I can say A is not. So the exclamation point here is also saying not equal to B. As you know, 3 is not equal to 4. So this is going to be true. A is not equal to B. Now, if I want to ask, I'm going to scroll up a little bit. When I use just one equal sign, I am assigning a value to a variable. So I'm saying A equals 3. This means that from now on, the variable A contains the value 3. If I want to ask if two variables or two numbers are the same, if they are equal, I have to use two equal signs. So I have to write equal, equal. And this is going to return either true or false, depending on the values that I have for each variable. So this is the note. Please do not mix it up with this. If you execute this, nothing will happen. But if you ask now for the value of A, it's going to be exactly the same as the value for B, because you just did that. You assigned one to the other. Now, if you want to test this, on your code and you want to execute code based on the result of this question, you can use the if statement. So you can say, if three is smaller than four, you print this thing. Now, is this true or not? Yes, three is smaller than four. So we are going to print this. So you can see that there's a little bit of white space in the beginning here. This means that whatever is um, in this block, is going to be executed only if the condition that I wrote is true, only if three is smaller than four. Now I can ask, is three larger than four? 
if it is, then you are going to print math is weird. What do you think is going to happen? Nothing happens because three is not bigger than four. And so you're not going to execute the commands that are in, under this block. You can do more complicated things. So for example, in this case, we are testing if the variable C is between four and 20, not including the boundaries, right? So if you wanted to include it, you would write something like smaller or equal, or you could write something as uh, smaller or equal here. So if you execute this now, it's going to say yes, C is between four and 20. What if I say C equal to 20? Is this now going to execute the print or not? It is not because I'm asking if C is strictly smaller than 20. If it is equal to 20, the condition is not true. So it's not going to execute whatever is in the block. You can also use and and or as extra ways to combine different conditions. So for example, if C is larger than four and C is smaller than 10, then you are going to print this. This is not gonna be true because I assigned a value 20 to C. Now, if I say C equals five, now it's this is going to execute because C is greater than four and smaller than 10. You can also check for uh, multiple elements at a time. So for example, if you have a list of strings, cat, dog, and mouse, and you wanna ask if cat is one of the elements in this list, you can ask if cat is in animals. So it's almost like writing in English. If this is true, then the uh, command that I have in the block is gonna be executed. You can also analyze strings and take a look at what is inside them. So remember that you can treat strings as lists. So each element of the string is like an element on a list. So if I have a file name, something like cells.tiff, I can ask if this file name ends with the expression tiff, then the file is an image. Um, so I can ask and it's going to answer me. Now, if I say cells.jpg, this is not going to work anymore, right? Because I'm not asking if it ends with JPEG. I'm asking if it ends with the TIFF. Now, if you have two different pieces of code that you should execute alternating. Uh, so for example, if quality is greater than 90, then you print or quality is high enough. If not, so if this condition is not true, then you're gonna print the second entry in the block. So you're gonna print, we need to improve our quality. If the quality is 89, what's gonna happen is the second entry. We need to improve our quality because it is not greater than 90. So you're going to execute the second block. And the ELIF statement is usually uh, useful when you have several different uh, conditions that you wanna test. So for example, here you have um, different layers of tests that you wanna do. So if percentage is greater than 95, you're going to return grade equal one. If percentage is greater than 80, grade is two. If it's 60, then grade is three and so on. So you can take a look at this later. And um, I'm doing this very fast because I know that we don't have enough time but you can look at this later and check the details and see if this makes sense to you. Next, I'm gonna go very quickly over loops. So again, the question uh, that was posed before was, let's say that I wanna test all of the entries or I wanna test all of the layers of my image or I wanna test all of the channels of my image. And of course, I showed you a way to do that with NumPy arrays, but let's say you have a list of images, you have a list of files that you want to go through, and you want to execute something for every entry in the list. That's exactly the, the uh, structure that we're going to use is what we call for loops. 
Uh, loops are meant to be run several times. So it's one command that I want to run several times, depending on some condition. In this case, I am saying for i, so i is a variable name that I'm inventing right now. I could put it whatever other name I wanted here. And for this variable, I wanted to take every value between zero and five, but not including five. Because when I say zero, five, I'm saying zero, one, two, three, and four, which are five values. This is complicated. And I want you to come back to this later because it's not very intuitive in the beginning but it's something that you need to get used to when you uh, think in Python. So make sure that you understand range and how this happens. And you start at zero, you get five values, so you never include the last point in the range in your result. So just to be clear, if I wanted to show something else here, for example, if I call this M and I want to print M, now, m is the variable that is going to take all of these five values. So I can call this whatever I want. So when I do for loops, I also need to use the same white space that I was using for the if, because again, this is a block of code that is going to be executed whenever the condition in the first line is true. So for I in all of this thing, I'm going to print I. Now, this is a little different than the previous cell because here you had range zero five, meaning I want to go from zero to five, but not including the last number. Now, if I say range with three input values here, I am saying I want to go from zero to 10 not including 10, and I want you to go every three values you're going to show me. So the result is what you can see here. So you can see it's 0, 3, 6, and 9, meaning that you are going three at a time, right? Now, you can also iterate over arrays or lists, and then you can do something with every entry in this list. For example, for every animal in my list of animals, I want you to print the name of the animal. So if you have dog, cat, and mouse in this list, it's going to print dog, cat, and mouse. Like, let's say that I add a fox. If I do this, it is now going to print all of the four animals in my list. Now, this example, I am going to skip because it's a little bit more complex. Um, the key here is the use of this thing called zip. And what it's doing here is it's going to combine two lists into this for loop. So you're going to take every entry in one of these two lists and show them in parallel. So you can see here you have paired measurements are one and four, paired measurements are nine and five, Paired measurements are seven and five and so on. So if you have two different lists that you want to iterate together, you would use zip. So I highly recommend that you check the documentation for this function in the Python documentation. Um, it is pretty good. And then finally, you can see the enumerate function, which is going to also print whatever is on your list, but in addition, it's going to return you the index of that element. So for example, you have a list with three values, dog, cat, and mouse. And if you say, I want to enumerate this list, it's going to return you two things, the entry in the list and the index to that entry. So when it prints, it's going to print both the index and the animal. So the animal number zero, in the list is dog. The animal number one in the list is cat. And the animal number two is mouse. So what it's doing here is showing you both the index and the entry. 
Now, this is not extremely useful when you're dealing with regular lists, but when you're doing some automation in your scripts, for example, it may be very helpful. So again, I highly recommend that you click here and you can see the documentation for the Python enumerate function. One final thing that you can do is generate lists using for loops. Um, so what you can do is create a list from an empty list. So you can start with something like this. And for every item in a range, you can append numbers to that list. So for example, for I in range zero to five, again, this is going to be executed five times you are going to append to this list, which means adding to the end of the list, i times two. So for i equals zero, you're going to add zero to the list. For i equals one, you are going to add two to the list. For i equals two, you are going to add four, and so on. Um, you can write this in a shorter way by using this um, uh, syntax that is called generators, or you can also see this sometimes uh, explained as a list comprehension, or um, people will, will explain this in different ways and explain different concepts with <laughs> the same name. So I highly recommend that you check this out. The generators link is here, and you can see some explanations about this. And this is a shorter way to write, but it's not necessarily clear, especially if you're beginning with your Python journey. Um, the conventional combination involving an if statement looks like this. So what does this mean? This means that you are doing a for loop and then uh, checking if the number is odd or even. So you're dividing by two and checking the result. So this is only going to be true if your number is exactly divided by two, right? So it's going to return only the, um, it should only return the uh, even numbers, sorry. And then the result is that number multiplied by two. Um, so I'm going to show you while loops because I think this is important and you're going to probably hit this uh, in your own code. So another way to do for loops or to do loops in general is to use a while condition. So the for, it's going to do a fixed number of repetitions. So when I say for i in range 0 to 5, I know that i is going to take all of these values, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. If I want to stop earlier, or if I want to skip some numbers, uh, if I want to include an extra condition, I will usually use a while loop. So for example, let's say that you have your number, which is 1024, and you want to test while your number is greater than one, you're going to divide it by two. What this is going to do is it's going to repeat this operation until your number is no longer greater than one. In that case, it's going to stop. And so this is what it's going to do here, right? It's dividing by two until your number is no longer greater than one. Um, and you can also use an extra condition called a break uh, that signals to your program that you want to stop that loop, you want to stop that repetition. So if your number is smaller than one, you're going to break. So you're going to stop your loop. Uh, so this would be similar to what we did before. The uh, difference is that here, our condition was directly next to the while expression. And over here, we are executing this forever. So while true, true is always true. And so we're going to be executing this forever. So we need an extra condition to say, hey, if this number is smaller than one, then I don't want to do the repetition anymore. So I break and it's going to tell your program to stop. You can also use a break inside a for loop and the uh, syntax is very similar. Now to skip iterations and loops, uh, you can also use the continue statement. And this is going to tell your program to go back to the for line. So for i from zero to nine, remember that you never take the last value, 
if i is greater or equal to three and smaller or equal to six you will not do anything you'll go back to the four line so this means that this block is executed for the numbers three four five and six and for every other number you're going to execute the print line and this is exactly the result that we have here um, so I'm telling my program to not to do something if my numbers are in a certain range. Again, you have a few exercises here. You can use this to read file names, for example, running for loops to uh, split images. So this is a very nice example that you can take a, a look at later. It's a little bit more complicated, but it is spelled out for you so you can check it out on your own. And finally, I want to go through functions. So we have mentioned functions before. You've probably seen this before at some point as well. Again, take a look at the documentation if you haven't. Uh, in any case, what we do is functions help us not repeat ourselves in our code. So whenever you find yourself repeating a piece of code over and over again, this is an indication that this is, should probably become a function. Um, so there are a few built-in functions that are already available in Python. For example, print is a function. How do I know that this is a function? Because it has parentheses. And it also may or may not in, um, require an input. So in this case, print is a function that requires a string as an input. And then when you execute it, it takes this per, um, take this parameter and doesn't return anything because actually it just prints it out to the uh, either your console or your Jupyter notebook, but it doesn't return a number. And you can see that because results doesn't have anything in it. So if I execute the cell, it doesn't really show anything because print does not return anything. Now, the power function uh, has two parameters. It is a number, uh, actually two numbers. So what it's going to do is it's going to return a result based on these two numbers. In this case, what it's doing is taking two and elevating to the exponent three. And so it's going to return the number eight. So functions can have entries and can have outputs. Sometimes they don't have uh, neither entries, not outputs, but they do execute some code inside. Um, you can define your own functions. And for that, you need to use this syntax, which is a def. So it's a definition of a function. In this case, the function is called some numbers. Uh, this uh, name of the function is your choice. And then between parentheses, you have the arguments for this function. So you have two arguments here, A and B and you're going to return a result. And this result is gonna be the sum of these two values. So I'm going to define this function by executing the code. You can see that it doesn't print out anything because I didn't tell you, I didn't tell it to print anything. But then when you call this function, it's going to return the sum of any two numbers that you give it to, to the function. So if you give three and four, it's gonna return seven. If you give it five and six, it's gonna return 11. If you want to save the result of your function, you can do that in a variable, just like we did before with the result of power. And for example, in this case, the sum of the numbers four and five is nine. I'm going to store this value in the variable C, and then I'm going to print C, and I'm going to get the result nine. Like I told you before, so if you want to simplify your code, you're usually going to use functions. So in this case, for example, we're creating a function that will print whether a number is an odd or even number. So it's going to test if this number is divisible by two. If it is, then it's going to return that this number is even. It's going to print to the screen that the number is even. If it's not, it's going to return that the number is odd. Um, so you can see that I don't have to repeat myself and I don't have to paste this same code over and over again. I can just use my function that I defined before and it's going to return whether a number is even or odd. Um, so instead of repeating myself in the code, I will use functions. Uh, finally, to document a function, meaning explaining what the function does, 
I can use what I call a doc string. So a doc string is going to be defined between three quotes. And these can be simple quotes like here, or they can be double quotes like so. And I can write multiple lines in here. And this is going to work. So all of the red part here, all of the text that is between these quotes is a comment. So it's not going to interfere with my code at all. But when I ask for the documentation of this function, and please make sure that you put two underlines here. So you have two underlines between doc. Um, when you ask the documentation of this function, it is going to print you the doc string that you wrote in your function definition. And this is very useful because as you are doing your code, if you're going to share it with someone else, or maybe if you yourself are going to come back to this code in the future, documentation is really important. Um, in IPython, in the console or on Jupyter, you can use the question mark and it's very, it's very helpful in giving you the name of the function, the arguments, and the doc string. So it's going to print you the doc string and show you what this function does. Uh, you can also do this with any of the previously like built-in functions of Python and it's going to show you what the documentation for that function is. And most functions in Python are very well documented. Uh, again, there's a few exercises here and one special exercise that I defined in the end that I just want to mention. So this one is going to tie all of these notebooks together. So you're going to use the same face image that we used on the masking notebook. And you're going to uh, apply the mask to those three channels, red, green, and blue. And then you're going to create a function that accepts an integer between 0 and 255 as an input, generate a mask for the image and apply it, and then show the image. This is a challenge. And so if you put all of these things that we talked about today together, you're going to make this work. You can use for loops, masking, and functions for this exercise. And maybe you even want to use conditionals so you can mix all of them together and, and exercise what you're learning about today. I think this is what I had. This is very fast and I'm, I'm sorry for going over, but I hope this was useful.